Well, thank you. This is um, part two on the evolution of modern medicine as described by William Osler's uh, book on the subject. We're going to have certain learning objectives for this lecture to understand the contributions of William Osler to medicine, be familiar with the role of Edward Jenner in the development of vaccines, to compare and contrast the importance of Lister, Pasteur, Koch, uh, Bernard to modern medicine, and be familiar with the role of technology in the evolution of the physician-patient relationship in the 20th century. So where we left the discussion at the end of the first part was through chapters one through four of the evolution of modern medicine, which was based on uh, the Silliman lectures given by Osler at Yale in 1913, and they were eventually published in 1921. Today we're going to finish up the last two chapters of the book, chapters five and six, and then continue on with some discussion of what has taken place in the 20th century. This is just a schematic of the evolution of medical knowledge uh, adapted from Dr. Eknoyan's uh, lectures a couple of years ago. And where we left the discussion was uh, we sort of did about two to 3,000 years of history in about 45 minutes, going from early antiquity to the beginning of the scientific revolution and the end of the Renaissance. Now we're going to spend some time talking a little bit more about the scientific revolution, the 19th century, and end up with a discussion of some of the things that have taken place uh, during the 20th century. This is how Osler begins his chapter five on the rise and development of modern medicine. In the middle of the 17th century saw a profession thus far on its way. Certain objective features of disease were known. The art of careful observation had been cultivated. Many empirical remedies had been discovered. The coarser structure of man's body had well been worked out and a good beginning had been made in the knowledge of how the machinery worked, nothing more. What disease really was, where it was, how it was caused, had not even begun to be discussed intelligently. So he's going to discuss a number of people in this chapter. One is uh, Giovanni Morgagni, who was instrumental in taking post-mortem exams and attaching it to clinical descriptions. Something about the Paris School of Physicians and their importance to the development of clinical medicine and physical diagnosis, and especially Dr. Lenek, who is instrumental in the development of what we've come down to be known as the stethoscope, and finishing up with Edward Jenner. So who was Morgagni? Morgagni was professor of anatomy at Padua, and as we mentioned last week when we talked about uh, Harvey, who had gone to Padua, Padua is a central medical school in the history of medicine, especially in Europe. It was the seed of a lot of the advances that took place in the 16th and 17th century as it, we understand anatomy. And you can go there and you can see the actual amphitheater where uh, Vesalius and Morgani and the others uh, did their dissections, did their prosections, and did their teaching of anatomy. He became famous uh, for a, a book which was published in 1761 called Translated on the Seats and Causes of Disease where he laid out the importance of post-mortem examination to clinical medicine. And Osler uh, is really uh, enamored of him. And so I'm going to just read a little bit from Osler's book as he, he relates to what Morgani talked about. From no section does one get a better idea of the character and scope of the work of this man than from that relating to the heart and arteries, affections of the pericardium, diseases of the valves, ulceration, rupture, dilation and hypertrophy and affections of the aorta are all very fully described. The section on aneurysm of the aorta remains one of the best ever written. It is not the anatomical observation alone that make the work of unusual value, but the combination of clinical with anatomical records. What could be more correct than the account of angina pectoris, probably the first in literature? And he quotes from Morgani's uh, letters on the subject. A lady 42 years of age who for a long time had been a valetudinarian and within the same period on using pretty quick exercise of body, she was subject to attacks of violent anguish in the upper part of the chest on the left side, accompanied with a difficulty of breathing and numbness of the left arm, but these paroxysms soon subsided when she ceased from exertion. 
In these circumstances, but with the cheerfulness of mind, she undertook a journey from Venice, proposing to travel along the continent when she was seized with a paroxysm and died on the spot. I examined the body on the following day. The aorta was considerably dilated at its curvature and in places through its whole tract, the inner surface was unequal and ossified. These appearances were propagated into the aorta, uh, the, the arteria innominata. The aortic valves were indurated. He remarks, the delay of blood in the aorta in the heart, in the pulmonary vessels, and in the cava would occasion the symptoms of which the woman complained during life namely the violent uneasiness, the difficulty of breathing, and the numbness of the arm. Pretty good description uh, tying in uh, aortic uh, uh, angina pectoris with what was found at post-mortem. He did this in a number of cases in a number of different diseases and sort of the father figure to combining what you saw at autopsy with trying to get the history of what took place before the patient had died. This was carried over to the Paris School of Medicine. The two leaders of that were Covasart and Charles Alexandre Louis. They were significant figures in the dissemination of clinical medicine, doing physical diagnosis, going into the postmortem uh, labs to combine that with uh, what they thought was clinical disease. Two of the people that became important, one before and one after, in terms of physical diagnosis was uh, Alan Brueger, who was a physician whose father uh, made beer and wine and had big casks. And his father was very uh, able to know where the level of the beer and the, the wine was in the cask by tapping on these wooden oak uh, caskets. And he picked up on that and he noticed that there was a change in the pitch uh, by just percussing on the wood. And he took that to the bedside and saw that he could do the same thing in terms of physical diagnosis of pleural effusions. And that was brought into the and picked up on by Covisart and others. Uh, Lanek is the one who's instrumental in developing the idea of auscultation of the lung and the heart. And he's important to our understanding of physical diagnosis. This is a picture of him examining a patient at the Necker Hospital where he practiced. And so he started out listening with a rolled up piece of paper against the chest wall and then eventually made, had some uh, beginnings of stethoscopes out of wood. These are some of the types of wooden stethoscopes uh, that were available and were developed for Lenec. And over the next quarter, half a century, this was one of the key elements to physical diagnosis that was taken in by physicians throughout Europe. Now we come to Edward Jenner, who lived at the latter half of the 18th century into the 19th century. And he's famous for his work on uh, understanding the relationship of cowpox to smallpox. And what he had observed among the milkmaids of the uh, farming country where he was, was the fact that they rarely got smallpox. And he knew that they had gotten these lesions on their hands that were related to uh, coming down with uh, cowpox, which were from the cows themselves. Didn't know why, but he just made the observation that they did not have uh, a high frequency of developing of smallpox. So let me just read from his book that he eventually publishes on these cases in 1798. The first experiment was made upon a lad of the name of Phipps in whose arm a little vaccine virus was inserted. Interesting he used the word virus, a nondescript. He didn't know it was a virus or a bacteria. Taken from the hand of a young woman who had been accidentally infected by a cow Notwithstanding the resemblance which the pustule thus excited on the boy's arm bore to variolous inoculation, yet as the indisposition attending it was barely perceptible, I could scarcely persuade myself the patient was secure from the smallpox. However, on his being inoculated some months afterward, it proved that he was secure. He went on to describe many other cases that are published in his book on the inquiry and the causes in uh, selection of variola vaccinia uh, as a disease. 1823 is when he... 1823, I'm sorry, 1823, yeah. Uh, and actually the book was published in 1798 and he had to publish it of his own account, out of his own money. Uh, no one would publish it otherwise. But this is the beginning of our understanding of, uh, and he didn't know that there was smallpox, he didn't know what it was causing, he just made 
the empirical observation that having gotten cowpox prevented you from getting smallpox, and he passed that on uh, for generations to come in. It's the backbone of our understanding of uh, other things that came after it called vaccinations, comes from this term. Now, Osler quickly goes over the idea of anesthesia, which occurs in the middle of the 1800s as one of the key issues, that along with antisepsis, for furthering the ability to do surgical procedures. There's a big debate, as far as I can tell, and Osler sort of hints at it, as to who should get credit for the first anesthesia, successful anesthesia for surgical anesthesia. Crawford Long, for many people, was the first to demonstrate it in 1842, but he published his work on ether in 1848. There was a dentist in Connecticut named Horace Wells who was working with nitrous oxide and thought he showed it, it to be of anesthetic use in 1844. Morton and Jackson at the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1846 uh, applied their ether uh, to a patient and successfully did an operation. Then there's also James Young Simpson who used chloroform in 1847. So you can see within a span of four to five years, several different people came forward with different ideas about what could be used for it, and they all had their place, their pros and cons. It wasn't until the 1880s that Carl Kohler described the local anesthetic effects of cocaine, and that was actually the original use for it, was an eye and dental work, was applying cocaine topically to do it, and actually, that actually turned out to be the, the demise in many ways for Dr. Halstead, who was a famous surgeon at Hopkins, who started uh, doing experimentations on himself and some of his colleagues with the local use of uh, cocaine and became addicted. The whole discussion of that is for another topic. Well, the other great person in the history of this is uh, Louis Pasteur. Uh, he was not a physician. He was really a chemist by training and sort of self-taught in biology. He spent many years looking at the lactic acid fermentation and felt that there was the presence and the multiplication of organic beings. He went on to do a lot of work for the wine and silkworth industry, which was in disarray at the time because they were uh, having problems with infection. And through a lot of work, he saved the industry. He also did experiments on anthrax. He's famous for the first vaccine against rabies, which at that time was called hydrophobia. And if you want to read a really uh, co a complete life of Pasteur, it was published in 1902 by Valerie Radat, and it's an excellent uh, compilation of all his significant contributions to medicine. Whoops. The other key person is uh, Robert Koch, who was a physician. He really is instrumental in inventing and perfecting the techniques that have come down, as we know it, of bacteriology. He was the first to develop cultures and plates. He spent a lot of years working on different kinds of staining techniques to pick up on these different organisms under the microscope. He spent a lot of time trying to figure out how you incubate different cultures, different temperatures, different amounts of oxygen to speed the growth of different organisms. He was the one who really sorted out that anthrax was a bacillus. But what he's probably most famous for was the demonstration of the tuber bacillus in 1882 which really led the way to now understanding what was tuberculosis, how was it caused, and how was it transmitted, and therefore how could they be intervened. He came down to also postulate, if we were going forward at that moment in time with the whole new idea of bacteriology, how do you, what do you need to say that a particular organism that you've pulled out of somebody is the cause of that particular infection? And he developed what has come down to be known as Koch's postulates, which he published uh, while he was alive. And here's what the Koch's postulate said. For an organism must be discoverable in every instance of the disease. Second, the organism recovered from the patient must be isolated in pure culture, and the culture must then be subcultured over several generations to ensure purity. The disease must be reproduced in experimental animals from a pure culture, obtained after several generations of pure culture, initially derived from the original sample. And finally, the same organism must be recovered from the experimental animal and subcultured through several more generations. This definition of Koch's postulates has been expanded over the years once we've had DNA and other ways of proving infection. So they have been uh, changed a little bit to incorporate 
our DNA technology to say there's an association between an organism and uh, the particular disease. But this is what was put in place in the 1880s, and this is what over the next 20 or 30 years led to the regular description of all these different organisms that we know of as causing different infectious diseases had to follow through these Koch's postulates. Lord Lister, Joseph Lister, was Regis Professor of Surgery in University of Glasgow. He had read about Pasteur. He knew about fermentation. He, knew, he was dealing as a surgeon with a lot of wounds and putrefaction and so forth, and he came up with spraying with carbolic acid to inhibit the growth of what he thought might be some, one of these bacteria which he did not see. And he published this in 1867 on the antiseptic principle in the practice of surgery. And this has been come down to be very important in terms of decreasing the likelihood of having surgical infections. Now there is a debate, and this is, I come back to who did Osler leave out? I think he left out two people that he could have mentioned and given credit, especially as it relates to um, how to prevent infections. One is Semmelweis and the other is Oliver Wendell Holmes. Semmelweis was born in Hungary and was devoted to obstetrics. Although he was born in Hungary, he actually went to Vienna where he did his training at the Allgemeines Krankenhaus with a lot of key people in the field of obstetrics and surgery. He did notice that the women who were postpartum were dying, a postpartum fever, came to be known as childhood or childbed fever, and he linked it to the lack of hand washing by physicians. Uh, and he wrote this up eventually in 1861, years after he had reported it, on the etiology concept and prophylaxis of purple fever. <clears throat> he returned to Budapest, sort of uh, shunned by everyone. No, many of the key people in his life uh, did not believe that this was true. He had good controlled studies in, in the actual hospital to show that he could dramatically re reduce childbed childhood fever if there was hand washing among the physicians. But he ended up passing away under unusual circumstances that is also debated. In a, in, in a, some people think he was poisoned. Some people think he got infected. Some people uh, think that he died in an insane asylum. The other person who also supposedly wrote about this, Oliver Wendell Holmes, wrote a paper on purple fever where he said uh, the same thing, that it had to do with the lack of appropriate hand washing. But his warning in the 1840s, even though he was not a practicing physician, had little effect on the public. And even today, we still have issues related to physicians washing their hands between patients. So uh, over 150 years later, we're still struggling with the issue of how the hands can transmit pathogens. The other person that's mentioned by uh, uh, Osler, and it's given a little bit of a discussion, He's actually a very important person in the history of actually experimental medicine. He never practiced medicine, although he was trained. He did a lot of clinical work, but he also did it in the uh, laboratory. So he was really a laboratory physician. He showed that sugar stored in the liver as glycogen was an internal secretion. And he wrote about the origin of sugar in the animal body and is probably most famous for his book on the introduction to the study of experimental medicine which, if you can get a hold of it, uh, is definitely well worth uh, investing in. It's a fascinating uh, book on the subject of early experimental medicine. I want to read directly from the book, uh, just a couple paragraphs, to get an idea of where he thought. This is in the, in the middle of the 19th century, remember. In a word, I consider hospitals only as the entrance to scientific medicine. They are the first field of observation which a physician enters but the true sanctuary of medical science is a laboratory. Only there can he seek explanations of life in the normal and pathological states by means of experimental analysis. I shall not concern myself here with the clinical side of medicine. I assume it is known or is still being perfected in hospitals by the new methods of diagnosis which physics and chemistry are constantly giving to symptomatology. In my opinion, medicine does not end in hospitals as is often believed but merely begins there. In leaving the hospital a physician, jealous of the title in its scientific sense, must go into his laboratory, and there by experiments on animals, he will seek to account for what he has observed in his patients, whether about the action of drugs or about the origin of morbid lesions in organs or tissues. 
There in a word, word, he will achieve true medical science. Every scientific physician should therefore have a physiological laboratory, and this work is especially intended to give physicians rules and principles of experimentation to guide their study of experimental medicine, that is, their analytic and experimental study of disease. The principles of experimental medicine, then, will be simply the principles of experimental analysis applied to the phenomenon of life in its healthy and its morbid states. So you're sort of the forerunner of what's come down to be the academic <coughs> researcher uh, in medicine. Rudolf Virchow was the founder of cellular pathology. He uh, made many observations on leukocytes, but also uh, looked at the relationship of cells and where they came from. So he went from a view of tissues down to the whole cellular level and saying that was where we needed to spend our time. He had almost a parallel set of interests in social problems, which are well discussed. He served in the Reichstag for 13 years, was very instrumental in a lot of social causes in Germany during that period of time, but came down to be known as the, the number one person focusing his attention on cellular pathology. And then finally in the chapter, Osler talks about chemistry. It is not making too strong a statement to say that the chemistry and chemical physics of the 19th century have revolutionized the world. It is difficult to realize that Liebig's famous Gießen Laboratory, the first to be open to students for practical study, was founded in the year 1825. Boyle, Cavendish, Priestley, Lavoisier, Black, Dalton, and others have laid a broad foundation in Young, Fraunhofer, Rumford, Davy, Jewel, Faraday, and Clerk, Mar Maxwell, and Hemholtz, and others build upon that and gave us the new physics <coughs> and made possible our age of electricity. New technique and new methods have given a powerful stimulus to the study of the chemical changes that take place in the body, which only a few years ago were matters largely of speculation. What did Oster leave out? He never mentions thermometers, x-rays, sphygmomanometers, or electrocardiographs, all of which were available to him when he gave these lectures. The thermometer had been in place since 1850. <coughs> Rankin described x-rays in 1895. In 1895, the development of the signal manometer was available, and Einhoven talked about electrocardiographs as early as 1901. So all of this was available. He leaves this out, doesn't really discuss it as it relates to clinical medicine. And then the last chapter is entitled, actually provocatively to me, The Rise of Preventative Medicine. He's now saying we're really in the midst of a revolution in what we would come down to talk about as public health. Sanitation and the pub British Public Health Service were instrumental. He spent some time outlining the experiments of uh, Walter Reed and uh, in deciding what was the pathogenesis of yellow fever and makes some mention for the public health development for tuberculosis curtailment especially through the efforts of people like Trudeau. So practical sanitation was put on a scientific basis in England in the 19th century. And here are four names, <coughs> I think, who are instrumental. John Snow, for those of uh, you who have read the Broad Street Pump discussion of cholera, he did some uh, terrific uh, epidemiology showing where and how cholera was spread in London uh, in contaminated water and sort of the, the classic epidemiologic study for outbreaks. Chadwick and Simon were instrumental in developing what came down to be the laws related to uh, practical sanitation. And William Farr was instrumental in developing the case for statistical analysis <coughs> in terms of their epidemiology work. Walter Reed and Carlos Finley are instrumental in terms of our understanding of uh, yellow fever. And they, uh, had different roles to play. Carlos Fever Finley <coughs> showed that there was transmission of, uh, it was not by fomites, but by mosquitoes that yellow fever was transmitted. <coughs> Walter Reed went on and uh, looked at how it was really propagated and published this in 1901. He inoculated volunteers with mosquitoes that he knew were infected with uh, something. And he also had mosquitoes that were not did not have it, and he inoculated volunteers, and those that came from mosquitoes with, which could transmit yellow fever were passed from volunteer to volunteer. It was not transmitted 
by fomites, which was, which was one of the reigning theories of the day. Colonel Gorgas, who was part of this commission, after learning about this, cleared Havana, where they did these studies, in nine months of yellow fever by just basically getting rid of all of the mosquitoes that he could, and went on to run the Panama Canal Commission through the isthmus when they're digging the Panama Canal, where there was a huge amount of uh, mal uh, malaria as well as yellow fever, and did the same sort of thing so that the dramatic reduction in yellow fever transmission through their efforts was a landmark in how you deal with mosquito-borne infections. Who did Osler leave out? Well, okay, he left out one interesting thing, women in medicine. I know I'd be asked about it, so I'll tell you what I think went on. He could have discussed Florence Nightingale. She was uh, instrumental and in sort of the founder of nursing and was instrumental, went to the Crimean War, was known as the Lady with the Lamp, wrote up her things, uh, her uh, exploits, came back to London and started the School of Nursing at St. Thomas Hospital. She always was a statistician and developed how you do statistical analysis of infections and other things in hospitals. She's a, a legendary figure in the history of medicine, but she was a nurse. She was not trained as a physician. So who were the physicians? Well, here are some women pioneers in medicine. The earliest cited female physician goes back 2700 BC. Uh, there were physicians practicing legally in fourth century Athens. When you get to names like Hildegard Bingham, she was considered Germany's first female physician, although she was really in an abbey and never officially got trained. But she conducted and published comprehensive studies of medicine and natural science. One of the more interesting ones is James Miranda Barry, who was a renowned female doctor who passed as a man to gain medical education and practice medicine. But the name that's come down as the first woman to graduate from a medical school in the United States is Elizabeth Blackwell, who graduated in 1849 from Geneva College in New York. And she's written her memoirs as what it was to be the first uh, woman graduate of a medical school in the United States. There are a number of women medical schools that were developed. The New England Female Medical College was founded in 1848. The Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, 1850. The London School of Medicine for Women in 1874, the Edinburgh School of Medicine in 1886, St. Petersburg State Medical University in 1897, Tokyo Women's Medical University in 1900, and Hackett Medical College for Women in China in 1902. So you can see that over the latter half of the 19th century, there were a number of women medical schools that were uh, put together. And so training did occur in, in these places, but they were unique to women. So I want to tie back Osler to this. And so there's a story behind this, and it has to do with Mary Garrett. In the beginning of the 1890s, the Hopkins Hospital had opened, but they did not have enough money to open the medical school. And they were about half a million dollars behind what they needed to really open it. And uh, some of the individuals from Hopkins went to Mary Garrett, who's in the center of this picture, and four other of her wealthy women friends who were daughters and wives of very wealthy men in Baltimore and said they formed what was known as the Women's Committee. Will you help us raise this money? And so they went out and they raised about $100,000. But they, when they came back, uh, they said, well, we probably need 500000 Mary Garrett said, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll go raise the money. But here's the deal. If we raise this money, you've got to guarantee that Hopkins will take women into medical school and we expect them to have a college degree and uh, we expect them to have taken some sort of language like Latin, French, German. And William Welch, who was the dean of the school of the, of the hospital or of the hospital at the time and dean, said we're not having women. He, he was an old curmudgeon and he didn't see how that was going to work out. Oster said, what are you crazy? If they can raise the money, we're open in the medical school. And he donated his own money, also donated to the Women's Fund, to see that it had happened. They recanted, and so they got the money, they raised the money, and three out of the first class of 18 medical uh, students at Hopkins uh, were women. And from that day on, there were women at Johns Hopkins. Ironically, some people have looked back on this and thought that the stipulation that they had to have 
graduate degrees and special, actually worked against women in the short run, since at that time it was actually harder for women to get into colleges than it was for men. So even though it was a laudable idea, it was changing the nature in the short run, making it a little bit more difficult. Nevertheless, Hopkins has had a long history of, of taking women, and that's how Osler hopefully will be remembered. So what did Osler also leave out? Well, he doesn't really discuss the growth of medical schools and hospitals in the United States, nor does he talk about the development of postgraduate medical education. And when this is written in 1913 and then 1921, the Flexner Report had already been published, and he knew firsthand what the Flexner Report never mentions any of this in the history of medicine. So the first medical school in the United States was in 1765, the University of Pennsylvania. Other schools quickly uh, came online. John Morgan and the Pennsylvania Hospital really were the beginnings of that. They became instrumental, and several of their physicians in the Revolutionary War, people like Benjamin Rush and others, were instrumental in helping the cause. Oh, but the Flexner Report is something that uh, you all should be familiar with. It was published in 1910, and it was supported by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, what they were hoping for was that there be fewer and better schools located in cities and large towns affiliated with universities and teaching hospitals. Flexner was an educator, and he was given money to go around the country and visit every medical school in the country and write it up and make recommendations. And he went to 148 medical schools, three of which were in Texas at the time, one in Galveston and two in uh, Dallas, and that they should be reduced to 31, and the number of graduates that were currently being graduated should be reduced in half, and that they should require two years of collegiate preparation and then require two years of preclinical work, and that there should be full-time teachers in laboratories and clinics, and that the fundamental educational technique was going to be learned by doing, which is a... Flexner, as an educator, was a real believer in that. Uh, this changed the landscape of medical education in the United States. Within five years, the number of medical schools went from 148, at least less than half. They didn't quite get down to 31. And many of them were associated then with colleges and universities. And so this is a landmark uh, report that changed the scope of medical education. A hundred years later, in 2010, there was an update called uh, Educating Physicians, a Call for Reform in Medical School and Residency, which updates in the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report what we should do with medical education. I would point out that if you read the writings of Osler, not in the history of medicine but elsewhere, he was actually one of the first to really develop the concept of postgraduate training, residencies. He outlined the importance of it, and in many ways, the difference between Flexner and Osler was Flexner knew that even though you graduated medical school, there had to be more training or you had to have a mechanism for keeping up. And so in many ways, I like to say that we, what we needed was an updated Osler report, not a Flexner report, because he really understood that no one was going out into practice with just a graduate degree in medicine. Everybody was going to get some sort of formal training, which turned out to be the case uh, over the last hundred years. They've picked up on a, with the 100th uh, anniversary by calling for a reform not only in medical school, but in residency as well. And I'm sure William Osler would be very proud of that. So what advances of the 20th century would have Osler listed as most important? I'm going to give you a guess, but I'm going to give you my guess as to what he would think were most important. Antibiotics, vaccines, insulin, DNA, CT scans, neurosurgery, transplantation and cloning. You can come up with your own list if I've left something off, and I'm sure I have. If you look at antibiotics, one of the key people who he did know about was Paul Ehrlich, who developed the side chain theory of immunity, developed the method for staining tuberculosis bacillus that we still use, but is probably as famous for using ars arsenic therapy, arsphenamine, a derivative for the treating of syphilis. It's one of the first treatments. It's not clear whether it was that useful, but it hurt a lot, and so I guess people thought they must have some benefit. <laughs> but here's the, the name that most people remember, Alexander Fleming. He discovered the antibacterial properties of penicillin by accident. The story goes, by a microbiologist, he goes on vacation, he's plating some bacteria, and he's coming back, and he left them on the counter, and he comes back, and there's a mold, this white mold, and 
around the white mold, all the bacteria, just big zone of clearance next to the bacteria. It just cleared them out. And so he started fooling with the mold, which was penicillium mold, and extracted what he thought was the property, the antibacterial property of which turned out to be penicillin. Howard Florey helped him, and Ernst Chain helped develop the production of this, and all three of them won the Nobel Prize for this activity in 1945. And over the last 50 years, there's been a myriad group of antibiotics developed for all sorts of infections. I think uh, Osler would have been thrilled at what had happened with vaccines. Not only did he talk about smallpox, but he wrote extensively about typhoid vaccine and was a big proponent of it for the Army in World War I, that every, every soldier should get vaccinated against typhoid because when he looked at the statistics from other wars, more men died of typhoid than they did of gunshot wounds. And so he wrote a famous pamphlet called Bacilli and Bullets, in which he basically argues in the uh, literature for saying all the, the government should mandate that all the, uh, the uh, armed forces get typhoid. And in fact, that's what happened to the British expeditionary forces in World War I. Pneumococcal vaccine comes on later. We're all familiar with the history of the Salk and Sabin polio vaccines. Here's a picture of Jonas Salk giving us in 1954. Influenza vaccines come online in the late 1940s. If you want to work on vaccines and you want to likely have a job for decades to come, work on flu. No one has figured out how to really solve that problem. Uh, it keeps changing, it keeps varying. And so uh, Salk worked on influenza vaccine in the late 1940s and got fed up with it and said to his mentor, I'm leaving, I can't figure this out, and went to Pittsburgh and within four years had the polio vaccine. So if you want to continue to work and have a physician in vaccines, work on influenza. Uh, measles, mumps, and rubella are another group of important vaccines for childhood infections. Meningococcal vaccines, hepatitis B vaccines, and some of the recent one on uh, papillomaviruses. We are just getting inundated with vaccines. But if you look historically over the past 100 years, the number one intervention that has probably saved more lives than anything else may be vaccines across the board. This is the story of Frederick Banting and Charles Best who discovered insulin. Uh, the older man is uh, Banting and the young smiling face is a medical student named Ch Charles Best and they discovered insulin with a lot of work on dogs. What's interesting about this is, and this is in Canada, in Toronto, but they won the Nobel Prize in 1923, but it was, the Nobel Prize was given to Banting and McLeod, who was the head of the laboratory that Banting worked in. Dr. Best, the medical student, and J.B. Collip, who was also instrumental in working on the discovery of insulin, didn't get named in the Nobel Prize. So for you medical students, okay, graduate quickly so you get your Nobel Prize. He probably, I'm sure, thrilled about the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953. Here again, Maurice Wilkins uh, was added to Watson and Crick for the Nobel Prize in 1962. Rosalind Franklin was left off, and that's been a source of contention for decades that she should have been given uh, due honor in that regard. He would probably be thrilled with Harvey Cushing, and the reason is Harvey Cushing graduated from Hopkins, and he led the revolution in neurological surgery, and he ended up writing uh, The Life of Sir William Osler, and that book, a two-volume book on the life of William Osler, is a classic for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. This is the neurosurgeon writing on the history of, and life of Osler, and he really trained the next generation of neurosurgeons that spread throughout the country. And won't even tackle all the ad advances he made in, in neurosurgery. And then heart transplantation would be an exciting advance. This is a picture that uh, Dr. Maddox gave me. This is uh, Christian Bernard, Michael DeBakey, and Adrian Kantrowitz. Christian Bernard uh, is given credit for doing the first human heart transplant in 1967. And I think the patient lived three days. Uh, Dr. DeBake, you all are aware of his contributions to heart transplantation and, and his, his uh, cancer rates. But in the United States, my understanding is that the performing of the first heart transplant in the United States was by Norman Shumway uh, in 1968. 
And so the rest is history in terms of the many contributions that a lot of other people have made to heart transplantation as it is to transplantation in general. Here's someone uh, we don't spend too much time on. This is Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. He's a pioneer in the field of computer tomography, CT scans, in the 1960s and 70s. He had worked on electronics and radar in the Air Force during World War II before studying electrical engineering. And he ended up being a joint winner of the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1979 with Alan McLeod Cormack. And they were touted as being the developers for CT, which dramatically changed our ability to do all sorts of diagnostic investigations. I, uh, he would probably also be very intrigued by cloning and Dolly the sheep, uh, first mammal cloned from an adult cell. He'd probably spend a lot of time talking about the ethics of all of that, and uh, he was very much interested in ethics and what was going to happen. I'm not sure how he'd come down on that in terms of weighing the, the ethical issues involved with it. And we're still struggling with that whole issue as we are today. So 90% of all the data available to humankind has been generated in the past two years. Much of it reflects advances in the biomedical sciences. I sort of divide the epochs a little differently than other people. From 1800 to 1950, I think what we did and what Oser describes is defining the phenotype of disease. If you read the 1892 Principles and Practices of Medicine of Osler, what you will come away with is that he had a very detailed fairly modern knowledge of the natural history of untreated disease. He knew what happened to diabetics. He knew what happened to people with pneumonia. He knew what happened to people with angina. He had very little in the way of interventions. And he talks about it. And in fact, that was one of the instrumental things about his book, which was he was basically a therapeutic nihilist and felt we needed to go and uh, spend more time understanding the disease before we can in intervene. But really, we've been defining the phenotype of disease once DNA came on board, and for the past 50 years, we've now added to that the defining the genotype of disease. And I think over, from 2000 over the next 30 years, we're going to be redefining phenotypes in light of genotypes. And so we're going to move in terms of treatment uh, from based on averages, which is what we often do, to what's come down to be known as precision medicine, where we link very detailed knowledge of the genetics of individuals with their phenotype with specific interventions. That's a lofty goal. So what influenced Sir William Osler's views of medical history? These are my thoughts on the subject. First, he was trained as a pathologist. That's the under, underpinning of everything he's talking about, and that's why he spends a lot of time talking about anatomy. He made his writings about pretty much like Morgani and others. He went to the postmortem. He looked at what happened. He studied it. He went back to his records to see what happened to the patient before they died to try the two together. But he also thought about ministry as a career and was interested in the humanities throughout his whole life. He had a classic education and was obviously interested in book collection. He ended up passing away in 1919 with a 10,000 volume library of his own, which he donated to McGill. And you can go to the McGill Library and see it. It's a fabulous place. He read other textbooks on the history of medicine, and he, again, followed the great men view of advancements. We can argue the point, is, is that the right way to look at history? He emphasized understanding anatomy and physiology and medical advances, but he underreported the role of disease in history, the role of women in caring for the sick and advances in surgery. This was not his uh, chief interest. So let me end. I'm going to end with just, uh, uh, again, a quote, a long quote, from Osler's Evolution of Modern Medicine. And uh, I think it summarizes what I think I like about the way he's approached the whole topic. I have tried to tell you what the best of these men in successive ages knew, to show you their point of outlook on the things that interest us. To understand the old writers, one must see as they saw, feel as they felt, believe as they believed, and this is hard, indeed impossible. We may get near them by asking the spirit of the age in which they lived to enter in and dwell with us, but it does not always come. Literary criticism is not literary history. We have no use here for the former, but to analyze his writings is to get as far as we can behind the door of man's mind, to know and appraise his knowledge, not from our standpoint, but from that of his contemporaries, 
his predecessors, and his immediate successors. Each generation has its own problems to face, looks at truth from a special focus, and does not seem quite the same outlines as any other. For example, men of the present generation grow up under the influences very different from those which surrounded my generation in the 70s of the last century when Virchow and his great contemporaries laid the sure and deep foundation of modern pathology. Which of you knows the cellular pathology as we did? To many of you, it is a closed book. To many more, Virchow may be thought a spent force, but no, he has only taken his place in a great galaxy. We do not forget the magnitude of his labors, but a new generation has new problems. His message was not for you, but that medicine today runs in larger molds and turns out finer castings is due to his life and work. It is one of the values of lectures on the history of medicine to keep alive the good influences of great men even after their positive teaching is anti antiquated. Let no man be so foolish as to think that he has exhausted any subject for his generation. Virchow was not happy when he saw the young men pour into the old body bottle of cellular pathology the new wine of bacteriology. Lister could never understand how aseptic surgery arose out of his work. Ehrlich would not recognize his epic-making views on immunity when this generation has finished with them. I believe it was Hegel who said that progress is a series of negations. The denial today of what was accepted yesterday, the contradiction by each generation of some part, at least, of the philosophy of the last. But all is not lost. The germ plasm remains, a nucleus of truth to be fertilized by men, often ignorant even of the body from which it has come. Knowledge evolves, but in such a way that its possessors are never in sure possession. It is because science is sure of nothing that it is always advancing. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge Robert Rakel, the former chair, who coordinated the History of Medicine lectures for years, John McGovern and the McGovern Foundation. He was one of the founding members of the American Oster Society and supported my invitation to join the American Oster Society. And that society, which has nurtured my love for the history of medicine and for the legacy of William Oster. Thank you. <laughs>